welcome to the travel show with me, Krista Lowood, coming this week from New York City. A little later in the show, I'll be heading out to Queens to test out my storytelling skills. Also coming up on this week's program. Rajan meets the travellers who'd rather visit a mall than a museum to shop till they drop. And Michelle takes to the skies in this month's Global Guide. Dubai, Singapore, Paris, New York and London. Some of the most popular travel destinations in the world. And also places where you can shop till you drop and gorge yourself on luxury labels, maybe bagging a bargain along the way. Shopping tourism is massive um, because shopping is uh, it's more than just a transaction. It's, um, it's an experience, it's emotional, it's sociable. Um, some call it sport, some call it an art, but it's more than just buying stuff. Um, and there's quite a lot of synergies between shopping and travel. Now look, of course, it's an age-old tradition to come back from a trip abroad with a few trinkets for the kids, a souvenir for your dad and a memento for your mum. But these days, the plundering of chic labels and exclusive brands, well, it's off the scale. And shopping has been officially acknowledged as a tourism phenomenon in its own right. The UN, no less, now recognises shopping tourism as a contemporary form of tourism fostered by individuals for whom purchasing goods outside of their usual environment is a determining factor in the decision to travel. In other words, hitting the shops is now high on the list of why many people travel. Um, currently it's Harrods yes. and um, the Oxford Street. You can get it's the same thing. But here, the shopping, it's an enjoyment. It's different experience. Everybody prefer to uh, make shopping from London because export and a lot of streets, it's a very, very important uh, trading street around the world. The UNWTO study revealed one in three tourists visit Barcelona primarily to shop and then spend a third of their total travel budget on retail. Singaporean tourists spend on average three quarters of their holiday budget during trips to the USA on retail goods. And some destinations like Dubai have made their shopping malls a prime attraction for visitors with three-day shopping festivals and extra incentives to keep the kids happy, like uh, the world's second largest crocodile. Whoa. The growing affluence of the booming middle classes in Asia and the Middle East over the last two decades has certainly had a marked impact on global retail. According to the China Tourism Research Institute, China had 120 million outbound visitors in 2015 and they spent more than 100 billion US dollars. That makes them the world's biggest aggregate spenders on their travels by some distance. Yeah, I was in Italy last summer, if you see it hundreds and thousands of Chinese and other guests, I think, queuing up in front of the luxury shops. They're doing this because I think it's a difference between 30 20 percent, which is a lot. And if it's discounts you're after, post-Brexit vote, go to London in the summer sales, where the bargains are easy. And that means ka-ching for the big brand stores. Mind you, none of the major UK retailers we approached wanted to be interviewed on camera. It seems for fear of crowing too much about the ringing tills they've been enjoying while the rest of the country's economy readjusts to the prospect of life outside the EU. But hang on a minute. Live life, we get money. We work hard, we get money. Some of us avid shopophobics may still be confused. Is the prospect of a bargain so appealing as to make it the primary reason why people holiday in a certain destination? Well, it's all about brain chemistry, apparently. We turn up every day, cause we don't mess with play, yeah. 
what you tend to get is a rush of dopamine. And the really interesting thing is, now you don't just get the dopamine when you shop, but we now know that you get the dopamine in the run up to going shopping. So because people go on holiday for pleasure, the moment they get on the plane, even before then, they're saying, I'm gonna have a nice time. And because people have decided they're gonna have a pleasurable experience, it means that there's arguably less impulse control as well, so that they don't really worry about their bank account when they're on holiday. They'll worry about that when they get home. And so that means that retailers can make even more money out of it. Kelly Craigshead is a senior executive and also a self-confessed shopaholic, indulging in over 100 countries, she says. It's the thrill of the hunt. Um, I certainly look for things that I couldn't find in the U.S. and I do think that's uh, an important part of travel is finding the little nook, finding the corner store, but knowing that you also have the big brands to really meet your needs when you're traveling. So really it's both and it's the thrill of the hunt. is the memento of buying a Louis Vuitton bag or a Versace, whatever, because it's a status symbol. And one of the things now, we live in a massive world where everything's interconnected, global population of seven billion people. And in retail, one of the aspects of this is if I can get something someone else can't, I'm further ahead. It's a survivalist streak in us. And so there's a competition against you and the person that might buy that product standing just behind you. Of course, there's one country that created consumerism as a lifestyle choice, even if you can't afford it. And this is where it all began, in Texas, America's oldest outdoor shopping centre. In a country which invented mass consumerism, surely this stands as an icon of classic Americana. Today, Highland Park Village in Fort Worth, Texas is very much a high-end retail estate with some brands out of most people's range and many purely functioning as a brand showcase. But they do serve a purpose. The luxury sector is a really good example of where um, shopping tourism is booming because they are kind of understanding the global consumer and that they will be in a shop and they want to spend money but they also might be online doing their research. So uh, you and I might get inspired by Instagram, we might look online for research, but then we might still head to the shop because we want the customer service, and especially if we're spending a lot of money. But I'm still uneasy about this retail frenzy. Now don't get me wrong, I'm all for immersive experiences over traipsing through some boring old historical building when you go abroad, but would you rather go to a shopping mall which is virtually identical to the one around the corner from where you live, over going to see an amazing piece of art at the Louvre, the Guggenheim, or the National Portrait Gallery. I would not really diminish the value of going to shop versus the value of going to a museum or a gallery or something like this. Both are important in people's life. Spending money is important, creating jobs is important, and living something different is important. So I would not really draw any very strong line between the two. And you know what? There is a place on this planet where an icon in the world of luxury shopping is not a retail outlet, but a recognised work of art. It's in the middle of the desert in Texas. Retail as high culture? What has the world come to? And if you like a bit of retail therapy when you travel, here are some of our top tips to help you get the best out of your next trip. Berlin came a surprise second in the latest shopping survey by travel website Expedia. It ranked the German capital ahead of London and runner-up to New York when it came to its variety of shops, visitor numbers and blogger recommendations. Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and Istanbul in Turkey also scored high on the list for lovers of retail therapy. Remember, it's well worth reading up on the laws concerning buying counterfeit products in any country you're planning on visiting before you travel. Although you might be tempted to buy that fake handbag in the hope it will fool your friends back home, it pays to know that some countries, especially in Europe, impose heavy fines or even prison sentences on anyone caught buying counterfeit goods. 
And although Asia is usually quoted as the best place to buy cut price consumer electronics, you often find better deals in America, where low import tariffs and sales taxes can mean that things like smartphones and laptops are cheaper than back home. Still to come on The Travel Show. Michelle Yana Chan picks out some of the best places in the world to be this month with her global guide. And we go way off Broadway in New York to watch real people tell their own stories. So, don't go away. I'm Michelle Yana Chan, your global guide with top tips on the world's best events in the coming month. Starting in the UK, let's hope the weather is kind for the Inside Out Dorset Festival, September 16th through 25th, a biennial event of outdoor art and performance. There'll be a celebration of the autumn equinox, a display of giant kinetic sculptures, cloud gazing, comic circus, and dazzling pyrotechnics after dark. All the events are free. To Sweden, where on August 13th, it's the Dalsland Cannot Marathon in the west of the country. It's a 55 kilometer canoe and kayak race across a wilderness of lakes and waterways with a chance of seeing elk, deer or moose. This is Sweden's largest canoe event and one of the world's most rigorous. And if that's not enough adrenaline, a few weeks later, it's the Ice Bug Experience, just south of here. This is a trail running and hiking race through the coastal landscape of Bohuslän, also in the west of Sweden. It's 75 kilometers over three days, the weekend September 2nd through 4th, passing oceanside trails, red granite rock, forests, and pretty traditional villages. There'll be plenty of hanging around in the Belgian capital, for the Comic Strip Festival taking place over the same weekend, September 2nd to the 4th. Over 100,000 visitors come to the capital for exhibitions, drawing workshops and author signings. There'll be a rally with vehicles that look straight out of the pages of the Tintin comic books, as well as the Balloons Day Parade on the downtown streets of Brussels of inflatable cartoon characters, including Billy, Spirou and Le Chat. For something more ethereal, one of the world's most captivating ballooning events, the Coupe Aeronautique Gordon Bennett, takes flight on September 15th through 24th. This year, the event is in Gladbeck, north of Essen in Germany, to commemorate the victory in 2014 of a German pairing. The goal, to fly the furthest distance from the launch site. The record stands at over 3,000 kilometers. With two pilots up in a wicker basket for several days, this is all about adventure, courage, strategy, and of course, luck. If you prefer the wind in your sails, head to the Camden Windjammer Festival off the coast of Maine in the US. From September 2nd through 4th, dozens of schooners and yachts will maneuver around the harbor. Staying in the US, the long-standing Bumbershoot Festival is in its 46th year in Seattle in Washington State. Thousands come for live music, drama, film and visual arts over the weekend of September 2nd to 4th at the Seattle Center. They don't know much about silence on the island of Aruba September 23rd and 24th. When the Caribbean Sea Jazz Festival takes place, there'll be three stages at the Renaissance Festival Plaza in Aronjastad with artists including Cesar Lopez and Habana Ensemble playing Latin jazz, dance music, DJ Ben Lebron, and Cool and the Gang. And finally to Denmark, where one of Scandinavia's biggest draws, the Aarhus Festival, takes over the city for 10 days from August 26th. Urban art and architecture, performance and music take over hundreds of venues, from streets to stages, alleys to galleries, that's my global guide this month. Let me know what's happening in the place where you live or where you love. We're on email and across social media. Until next time, happy traveling.
Thanks, Michelle. Well, to finish this week, let's head to New York, where truth is sometimes stranger than fiction, and people are now getting the chance to tell their own stories on stage at a regular event called The Moth. Broadway. It's home to some of the biggest productions in theatrical history and where tourists from around the world come to watch A-listers tread the boards. But here in the Big Apple, there's another type of show that's pulling in the crowds, one where the stars are New Yorkers themselves. But I'm here to find out about the revival of an older form of storytelling. And I'm heading to Queens to meet a man who can tell me all about this new, old tradition. Tonight's event is hosted by Peter Aguero, a veteran storyteller. And there's a chance I might be taking to the stage too. Well, you know, storytelling is the oldest form of communication. People have been doing it since forever. Cave paintings were stories, you know. But in the, definitely in the, in the last, maybe, I don't know, 15 to 17 years, there's been this revival of people wanting to hear the true first-person narrative stories. And, and The Moth was definitely the vanguard of that, although there are groups all over the U.S. that, that do this. So you're the expert. Tell me, what makes a good story? Well, I mean, the simple answer to that is you start at the beginning and you tell the truth. All right? But it's obviously more complicated than that. It, there has to be a change. Then that's, that's the key, right? Nobody wants to hear a story where you woke up in the morning and you were awesome, and at the end of the day, you were awesome. No one cares about that. We want to hear you fail. The Moth was founded back in the late 90s. The idea came from a poet and novelist who wanted to recreate the feeling of southern, sultry summer evenings in his native Georgia, when moths were attracted to the light on his porch where he and his friends would gather to tell stories. Now people from cleaners to school teachers and war veterans are getting the chance to share their own personal stories in front of audiences across New York City and beyond. I guess that it feels authentic, also that it's an art form that anybody can do. You know, I, I can't ever be a sumo wrestler, I, I can't really dance so well, but you know, I probably can tell a story that is human communication, so it's very accessible to all kinds of people. I can't hold a tune, but I can tell a story. Tonight's moth event is being held at Flushing Town Hall, an historic building located in Queens to an almost sold out crowd. The show started in um, 2001. Little show in New York City, Lower East Side. Few people, I was begging my mother to come. You know, somebody please come into the audience and tell some stories. Um, then by word of mouth it grew. Then New York City got two slams a month. Then we moved into three, then to four. Then we're like, maybe we can try Los Angeles. And now we are in 26 cities all over um, the world, actually. So we're not only in um, cities all over America, but also we're in London. Um, we're in Dublin, we're in Sydney and Melbourne, Australia. Our first storyteller this evening will be Liv Lansdale. Come on! Anyone who wants to tell a story has to come prepared. The idea is that stories have to be told and not read, meaning no scripts or notepaper to hand. Somehow that dog ended up telling me everything that I now know about love. Each event features 10 volunteer storytellers who are picked at random. And every other Saturday, my sister, who was older, a friend, and I would go to the movie. They can talk up to five minutes each and are then given a score by a team of judges. The winner goes on to perform at the Moth Grand Slam, so no pressure then. She forgot that she's, that she's got to write down the scores. This is quite nerve-wracking, and the prospect of me having to be up on that stage sometime soon is kind of freaking me out. 9.2, very nice, we applaud. Strictly between you and me, I'm secretly keeping my fingers crossed that I won't be chosen. So you can imagine my horror when this happened. I keep it going for Chrissy, come on the stage now, come on, flush it! Here she comes, keep it going, feels good. Come on, just make a big move, bring her up here, here she comes. Right now, there she is, come on, come on! And although I do perform for a camera for my day job, up here I feel exposed and generally out of my comfort zone, as you can probably tell. Get real close to the mic. Oh, hi. Hi. 
Uh, I'm a travel journalist and a little while ago I was in Japan and I was there to interview a very famous chef and this, he's sort of bringing out with great sort of pomp and ceremony this dish that he's created for me uh, and it's coming towards me and it has a, kind of a crab leg sticking out the top and, and of all the things that I just can't eat and there are many many things that I can't eat just seafood is right up there at the top there's almost nothing from the sea that I will happily put in my mouth and so I asked my translator I was like and what is this and uh, she kind of looked at me and she said oh, she asked the chef and she said oh it's uh, it's fugu you know fugu it's like a, the Japanese puffer fish right you know the one that if they just prepare it very very slightly wrongly you die because it's full of neurotoxins and I was like oh <laughs> And so I, 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 I went to put it in my mouth and uh, <clears throat> I kind of bit down on it and it, and it sort of, it didn't, it didn't yield in the way that I thought it, 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 it popped in my mouth like a cyst, you know, like... <laughs> Despite my nerves and to my total surprise, I came joint runner-up at tonight's contest. But the hands-down winner was Juliette Holmes, a retired grandmother whose endearing story about her early childhood really won over the crowds. How we turn the movie show out on a Saturday afternoon in Savannah, Georgia in 1950. Thank you. So if you're coming to New York and fancy a change from Broadway, then the moth could make a good night out. And who knows, you could even end up on stage yourself. I think I might have found a new hobby there. That's all we've got time for on this week's show. But coming up next week... Wow. Yeah, <laughs> this is it. Henry's in Turkey to take part in a dig that's uncovering 8,000 years of history on a scale that's truly breathtaking. Despite all the research that we do, there is always the element of the unknown. So do join us then if you can. And in the meantime, don't forget, you can catch up with us while we're out having our adventures on the road in real time by signing up to our social media feeds. And details are on the screen now. But for now, from me, Krista Larwood, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in New York City, it's goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>